Hey everybody, this is Mr. Baker. This is Baker's Backyard, another installment of Baker's, uh, of Baker's History. And I want to uh, welcome you to our second lesson in the area of what we call the Progressive Era. And so think about what we talked about before. What is the big picture of Progressive Era? It's going to be a time period of a significant reform in American history. Um, the government is taking upon a lot more responsibility, a lot more active uh, nature. Um, you know, you think about guys, all these different things that relate to the rise of a modern industrial American state or country and ergo what happens. A lot of these progressives, people, as you see on your screen that are more presidential with their actions, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and also Woodrow Wilson. Now there's a lot of historical debate as any historical topic has about what is the most, or who is, excuse me, guys, the most successful of the progressive minded presidents. And I want you to kind of think about that as we go through here. Feel free to stop your screen whenever you need to or to pause your screen for notes and things. Okay. But I want you guys to take a look at these three progressive presidents. So we've got the youngest president ever to serve in American history by the name of Theodore or Teddy Roosevelt. Um, now, one thing to not get mixed up with a little bit of background here is that when we're talking about the youngest president ever elected, that is actually going to be John F. Kennedy in 1960. Okay, so a lot of you guys are probably wondering, okay, well, Mr. Baker, you just said Theodore Roosevelt is the youngest ever to serve. How is there a difference? Well, the difference is, guys, is that Theodore Roosevelt was originally the vice president of, uh, of William McKinley's second presidential term. Okay, so, you know, William McKinley is elected in 1896. The Republican Party said, hey, you know, we have a, a really young up and coming politician that we think would be a really good VP candidate. You know, whether they were grooming him for a future presidency, you know, down the line is certainly up to debate. What happens to McKinley shortly after he took his second administration? He's going to be assassinated. And ergo, that opens up the green light, if you will, or the opportunity for Theodore Roosevelt. All right, guys, Roosevelt is one of those really interesting people. Some people call him an original. He loved the presidency. He's the kind of person, guys, if you think about it, as we move into the modern 1900s or 20th century, that really puts the presidency on a very different, I would say, course of action because he's very active. Not to say that we haven't had some active presence before, but he's going to be extremely active with the idea of reform, moving the country further, foreign policy as well, but we'll talk about that in one of our future lessons. Um, he also kind of makes a hand-picked successor by the name of William Howard Taft, all right? They were friends. They were good buddies at the time. They eventually kind of stray courses. We'll look at in a second. Um, Taft is progressive in one way, which we'll look at, but you know he's not as conservative in regards to things like the uh, the conservation or some of those things, but he is very progressive. And when it comes to things like um, fighting against the regulation of trusts, right? He's a big trust buster, you know. And then, of course, our final progressive president is going to be a gentleman, as you see right here, by the name of Woodrow Wilson. Um, he is a has a great resume. He's an academic. He had a PhD in political science. He is going to be the president of Princeton University, so that's a pretty important position he taught there. Uh, he also was a governor of New Jersey before he actually became president, so he's got a lot of you know things to kind of build up his resume. So who gets this party started for the progressive presidency? It is going to be Theodore Roosevelt. Now, guys, feel free to basically stop your screen and take a few things down because there's a lot of things for us to get through in about a 45 to 50 minute period. So guys, what does Theodore Roosevelt really do? He's going to jumpstart what historians label as his square deal. Okay. Now what we notice moving forward is that a lot of these presidencies moving forward, you see this with Roosevelt, Theodore that is, you see this with Wilson's New Freedom, you see this with FDR's New Deal, the Fair Deal of Truman, etc. Okay, is that you're going to start to see certain kind of like phrases or certain titles, if you will, given to these presidential administrations. Now, his square deal, as he called it, is going to be centered around the three C's, conservation, consumer protection, and also fighting against corporations. 
Okay, so the one thing, guys, to keep in mind with the idea of these three C's is that they're all going to be very defining to Roosevelt's mostly two terms in office. Remember, he does get elected to a second full term, but he serves mostly the second term of McKinley, but not the entire thing. Okay, so when we think of conservation, guys, think about it like this. What probably comes to mind when you think of conservation? You think of conserving something, okay? And guys, in the case of Roosevelt, this was conserving things like land, you know, for uh, protecting national parks, okay? You'll notice, guys, a couple of really important things that were passed under him by Congress. Remember, guys, the president can set an agenda and tone for a certain agenda, but he has to usually have a lot of support by Congress. And guys, Roosevelt is going to be a very strong advocate. And Congress, for the most part, was on his side, all right, as was, in a lot of cases, the Supreme Court. Okay, So with conservation, guys, he was, a, he, he was a person that loved to travel. He loved to hunt. You know, when his time in office was over, he actually took a couple of um, you know, months and even years off to take a safari over to Africa. And I realize, guys, a lot of you are like, well, Mr. Baker, Africa is not in the United States. That's a completely different continent. But guys, he loved nature, right? So therefore, the idea of protecting lands so that you can hunt on it or actually have access to being able to see its beauty, that is what he's going to associate with conservation. Okay, so you might say, well, okay, this National Reclamation Act and the creation of the U.S. Forest Service what does that really have to do with conservation? Well, guys, basically what's going to happen is that a lot of the land, if you've ever been to a national park like Yellowstone or um, you know, somewhere like Grand Canyon or somewhere like that, there's a lot of different ones, but those two come to mind. You'll notice, guys, that Roosevelt saw a lot of this natural beauty as almost like priceless works of art. One historian, Douglas Brinkley, who's a well-known historian that writes a lot, about these topics, I think put it like this. He said that basically Roosevelt saw the natural beauty of conservation almost the same way that you would see a work of art in the French uh, in the French Museum that we call the Louvre, right? So when I went there years ago, I got to see Mona Lisa literally, guys, within like about a three or four you know um, feet period. You know, imagine. You know, when you go to a place like um, Grand Canyon and you see like the elk and all the nature and even some of the, the visual things that go beyond uh, animals, guys, that is what uh, Roosevelt is wanting to protect. OK, and a lot of you guys will say might say, well, Mr. Baker, essentially, what is he trying to protect this from? I'm glad that you asked that. One of the things he's trying to protect us, uh, the land against is the idea of corporate development. Right. OK. So guys, imagine, you know, there's a case to be made that if Roosevelt doesn't step in and protects a lot of these lands, you know, we might not have them, right? That you would have had corporate America, companies, in other words, build, uh, buying up all this land, building on it, taking away the national be natural beauty. <clears throat> and that is something that Roosevelt was definitely uh, against allowing to happen. Okay. Consumer protection. Guys. One of the authors, the muckrakers, that we talked about briefly in our first lesson was Upton Sinclair. Okay. And guys, if you remember, the basic nuts and bolts of his book, The Jungle, was the effects were workplace safety needs to be reformed. Right. Remember, the meatpacking industry was a big focus of that text. The second thing <clears throat> that really comes out of the effects of that work is going to be the idea of if you're a consumer, okay. You're eating meat, you know, you're using prescription drugs, things like that. Later on, that's going to be automobiles, other things that obviously have consumer, you know, use, et cetera. <clears throat> the argument, guys, is going to be made that the manufacturers and even the businesses are not protecting their workers and they're not protecting the rights. That's a key word here, guys, rights. We as consumers have rights and workers have rights. And if you come to the conclusion, guys, that these companies and corporations are not going to adequately advocate for the rights of these people, then what needs to happen? You guessed it. Government involvement. All right. So you're going to see a lot of laws passed at the federal level, state, local to an extent, 
Now guys, take a look at these two acts. These might be worth noting, the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act. Okay, so pretty much if you've ever heard of the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA, that is going to be a government organization or agency that actually came out of the Pure Food and Drug Act. Okay, it's still around whenever you, you know, for those of you guys that are paying attention to things like COVID, et cetera, et cetera, right? Whenever we have a new prescription that's on them, that's basically being seen, is it going to be approved by the FDA? That is basically a government organization or group that says, okay, we give the green light for it to be sold and actively processed within the United States. Okay. Um, that is considered to be a consumer protection act. Okay. The example I'll give is this. About 20 years ago, a little bit less than that actually, Mr. Baker got a really bad case of poison ivy. Okay. So anyway, it's uncomfortable. I went to the doctor. The doctor said to me, he goes, hey, I'm going to give you this medication. The side effects are you're going to basically have a lot more energy than usual. It's essentially a steroid. Okay. And so I'm like, okay, fine. Well, I get it basically, you know, filled. I'm supposed to actually go and get a refill because all of the condition had not gone away yet. And meanwhile, I'm noticing that I am, in fact, a lot more energetic, which I usually am pretty energetic to begin with. So anyway, so go to the pharmacy. And I won't mention which one it was. And so I go to get the refill. The pharmacist comes up to, you know, he said, Mr. Baker, can you come to the side area so I can have a one-to-one -one consultation with you? I said, sure. So he said to me, he goes, first of all, we need to apologize to you. You were supposed to be taking 50 milligram tablets of this particular medication. We actually made a mistake and we actually gave you the 100 milligram um, prescription, which basically made sense with why I was so hyper compared to where I was supposed to be. Okay. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring it up because I knew what my rights were. So, I quoted the federal, or I'm sorry, the Pure Food and Drug Act, and I said, you know, I know this was not an intentional mistake, but technically, what would have happened had I had a really bad reaction? I would have basically had to go to the hospital. This would have been a major problem, you know, and guess what they did? They actually worked with me so that my second dose was actually at a reduced rate, all right? Now, why do I bring that up? You know, I wasn't going to do a lawsuit against them. I do think it was a, a you know, a, a mistake that was in, in good, you know, honesty or whatever. It wasn't meant to be malicious. But guys, what's the point? The point is, is that you have rights as a consumer. Okay. The Meat Inspection Act is the same thing, right? For those of you that actually buy meat occasionally, you'll notice they talk about how many ounces it is, how much fat content. Okay. When is the expiration date, et cetera, et cetera. Those are things, guys, that are associated with protecting the rights of consumers. And that's not going to go away. Okay. We know that as America becomes more modern, moving further into the 1920s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, we know that technology, cars particularly, automobiles, et cetera, okay, are going to become a larger part of our consumer culture. Okay. So therefore, what do we notice? These acts are important. Roosevelt, guys, bringing it back to him for the moment, read the jungle. He was appalled. In other words, extremely upset. He encourages Congress to act. And a lot of you guys might be thinking, well, Mr. Baker, okay, how does that affect other things? Sanitation as well. Okay, guys, one uh, historian put it like this. Every time... We go to get a drink of water, water out of our faucet. Now, I know a lot of you probably drink bottled, filter, et cetera. Okay. But guys, there's going to be a lot of things. Like if you go back to the urban conditions of cities, that actual, the focus on sanitation, that is a big reform. I'm not so sure if those things would have been successfully done had it not been for the progressive presidents, particularly in this case, Roosevelt. Okay. All right. Last but not least of the three C's, corporations or corporate reform. Okay, now guys, take a look at the big picture here. The goal was to regulate unfair business practices. Okay, that's the big picture. Now, here's the thing for us to keep in mind. 
All right, you're welcome to stop here if you want to. Okay. Um, we do have an antitrust piece of legislation on the books. What is that? You got it. The Sherman Antitrust Act that was passed in the year 1890. Okay. This is still around. It's not been actively enforced, at least in, in the way that some people thought. So, guys, what's going to happen? Roosevelt, as we'll see on the next slide, is going to be a little bit selective, you could argue, with what trust that he's going to go after. Okay, so for example, take a look at a couple of these examples of trust cases. This one is going to be during the era of Roosevelt's presidency, talking about Theodore. The other two, as you can see, are actually going to be during the era of Taft, for reasons we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so first of all, the Northern Securities versus the United States in 1904. Okay, the big picture here is to dissolve the railroad company trust that was being operated by a gentleman by the name of J.P. Morgan. Okay. Now, a lot of you guys are looking at this and you're like, well, Mr. Baker, you have the word bad trust here. Okay. And the one thing, guys, that you might want to note here is that Roosevelt does distinguish between what he calls good and bad trusts. Okay. And so a lot of you guys might be wondering, okay, well, how is Roosevelt going to distinguish between the two? Okay, I'm glad that you asked that. Because if you go back to Roosevelt, guys, it almost always comes back to is something having a negative or positive effect on the public interest of the American people. Okay, and in the case of the railroad with, with uh, Morgan, his argument was is that Morgan's trust is not operating in the best public interest. Ergo, it is a bad trust. Okay, now this is according to the, the viewpoint of Roosevelt. Now, a lot of you guys might be wondering, well, why doesn't he go after American tobacco? Why does he not go after Standard Oil of John D. Rockefeller, etc.? Okay, the reason being, guys, is because Roosevelt does not see those trusts as bad trusts. They didn't take advantage of prices in his view. They didn't actually have a negative effect on the consumer. You know, maybe the workplace safety was an issue, but he didn't focus on that quite as much in those regards. Okay, so therefore, he basically says, okay, those are bad trusts. Now, one that is not on this slide that's interesting and important is another one that actually Roosevelt gets heavily involved in, and that's going to be what's called the anthracite coal strike of 1902. Now, a lot of you guys are wondering, was the coal industry kind of like a trust or potentially, and the answer is yes. Okay. So in 1902, you have this big issue that's popping up. It's the winter time. It's the American Northeast. We know that coal is important for the standpoint of, of, of having heat and energy and things like that. The people are potentially going to freeze to death. Now, why did the workers go on strike? This is the connection to labor unions. You got it. They don't like their wages. They don't like their workplace conditions and safety. Ergo, they go on strike. Roosevelt sees this as a national catastrophe because it's going to affect the public interest of the people. If you can't survive because you're freezing to death, guys, Roosevelt, for good reason, I would say, is going to look at that as an issue of public interest. Okay. And he's also going to see it as big business has way too much control in that regard he steps in. Okay. And guys, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about during the labor union uh, lesson that we did, we talked about one of the big picture things with that, which was the use of things like collective bargaining and arbitration. Okay. Roosevelt forces both sides, labor and management to come to an agreement. Government officially stepped in. Who would you consider that to be a victory for? I personally would consider it to be a victory for, you got it, labor, because their conditions were bettered, their pay was actually gone up. Now, was it dramatic? Probably not. But at least he's sending the message that, you know what, we're not going to let big business actually have as much control. With that being said, the political cartoon is obviously important. Now, guys, if you were to type in Theodore Roosevelt, you know, trust cartoons. These two will pop up, but the one on the left here 
is definitely going to be the one that's probably the more common. Now, take a moment to analyze this. You can stop your screen if you want or your uh, recording. Okay, so what is the whole point? He's an outdoorsman, right? He's hunting bear, as you can see, right? Whether you agree or disagree with that, that's not the point behind the cartoon. Each one of these bears represents a different set, a set, excuse me, of worker, I'm sorry, of, of business interests. The bad trust, that would be coal. That would be the railroad. That's why that one is dead, as you can see, or shot. The good trust, you'll notice, is humble. That's going to be trust like Johnny Rockefeller, etc. Now, with that being said, Roosevelt has a decision to make in 1908, and that is, does he run for a third term? The answer at this point in history, he does not. So what does he try to do? He tries to actually keep his policies moving forward. And what does he do? He actually handpicks or at least supports the candidacy of one of his good friends at the time, for the time being, William Howard Taft. Taft really, guys, did not want to be president, but he doesn't want to let his friend down. And so what does he do? He says, okay, I'll run. Roosevelt gives him basically his support, in other words, his endorsement, and Taft is going to win and go on to be a one-term president. All right. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about the latter two things here, but the one progressive success of William Howard Taft is really significant. Okay. Because he does not distinguish between good and bad trust. He's going to be a true trust buster. All right. Which, guys, if you go back to this previous slide, you'll notice that between 1909 and 1913, William Howard Taft is going to have some of the most successful trust courts decisions in the history of the U.S. Supreme Court with trust. You'll notice 1911, the same year, American Tobacco, that was very heavily influenced by James B. Duke in Parson, North Carolina, etc. It is going to be ordered to be dissolved. The same thing with John D. Rockefeller Standard Oil. Okay, so both of those companies, guys, and you can pause this if you need for the moment, are going to basically be dissolved. Now, let's explain what we mean by that. That's not to say that the companies don't continue to operate. That just means that when they started buying out all these other companies, there has to be kind of like a breakup of some parts of their company. That way, there's more competition. Okay. Now, think about it like this. What does that illustrate about the difference, guys, between Roosevelt when it comes to trusts and Taft? Okay. Some people would say that Roosevelt here is more of an idealist. Okay. You know, all right. Not all these trusts are horrible, right? Some might be taking a little bit of liberty with the law, but at the end of the day, they're not having a negative impact on the public interest according to his view. Taft, ladies and gentlemen, does not look at trusts in that regard. Okay. Some historians will put it like this. I think it was H.W. Brands who also wrote uh, a lot of books on this topic, guys. He says that Roosevelt almost always sees the reality of life in terms of good and evil. Right. So it's almost like if you're looking at Star Wars, you've got the Rebel Alliance versus the Empire, right? You know, Taft does not distinguish the same way between good and evil with trusts. If you're a trust, you're illegal, you're not meant to be you know, operating, ergo, we're going to go after you. All right. So that's going to be what he does. And I would argue, just for the sake of giving you my perspective, if you look at all the three presidents in some regard, Taft is going to be, in my mind, the most successful when it comes to the idea of trust busting, especially with the U.S. Supreme Court on his side. Okay. Now, a lot of you guys are like, "Oh man, then he must be, you know, he must be obviously a popular person, you know, amongst Roosevelt." Mm, not so fast. Okay. The one thing, guys, and I'll mention very briefly here, is that, and we'll look at this more with Wilson in a moment, is that the tariff issue pops up. Progressives overall held the position that tariff needed to be lower to protect the rights of people like farmers and, and, uh, and so forth, okay? And they also believed, again, that conservation was essential. Taft does not hold a strong track record 
with protecting the wildlife through conservation or lowering the tariff. Okay, so guys, what happens after about four years in office, 1912 rolls around. Roosevelt is still alive. He lives until, I think it was 1920, 1921, something like that. Okay, um, he's not real happy with Taft. He basically sees Taft as kind of like unraveling a lot of his policies and a lot of his instincts. What does he do in 1912? Good that you asked that. He's going to actually try to get the Republican nomination so that he can actually run for a third term. 1912 is a packed affair with the presidency. Taft, you know, even though Roosevelt does not get the Republican nomination, Taft is not going to basically try to lose lying down. The Republican faction that's more conservative ends up renominating Taft. Taft is on the ticket. Roosevelt says, fine, I'm just going to run as a separate third party. Ergo, the Bull Moose Party, which is basically a progressive party. He advocates for things like, you know, voting rights, more direct democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. What does he also advocate for, guys? The idea of, you know, being more active with things like lowering tariffs, et cetera, which he was, he was not really successful with that in his, his first two terms. But of course, you know, he did a lot of other things. Then we have Woodrow Wilson, who's the third major candidate, right? Or, or the third candidate that stands out quite a bit. The Democrat, who's also very progressive that we'll look at in a second. And then you even have a fourth part, uh, candidate that was a socialist by the name of Eugene V. Debs. Debs actually got votes in this election, guys, actually a decent number of them. Okay, now, at the end of the day, this is going to be a really tough election to win if you're the Republicans because your party is kind of divided. Okay, you're losing votes because, all, you know, um, most of these candidates have some progressive ideas. Who is going to win? It's going to actually be Wilson. Okay, so Wilson wins and he goes on to serve two full terms as president. Although, kind of a neat little detail here, guys, his second term, he's actually going to have a pretty significant stroke as a result of some issues related to him trying to get the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles passed with World War I. And he's going to have a lot of health problems to finish his second term. Okay, all right. So Taft, kind of a funny thing here, or interesting thing, does not win. But guess what he actually did? He went on to become, get this guys, a chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, which was arguably his biggest passion to begin with. He loved law. He loved the court. He actually is going to be a president, a former president, excuse me, that's going to be actually uh, helping presidents take the oath of office as the, uh, as the U.S. Supreme Court uh, chief justice does, if you didn't know that. Wilson. Now. This is actually, guys, preceding his presidency, but I want you guys to think about this quote and what you think it might mean for his approach to progressivism. Um, this is actually him, and as you can see here, uh, commenting the authors and signers of the Declaration of Independence. No doubt we are meant to have liberty, but each generation must form its own conception of what liberty is. But Mr. Jefferson and his colleagues in the Continental Congress prescribed the law of adjustment for no generation but their own. They did not attempt to dictate the aims and objects of any generation but their own. Now, let me ask you all this. Would you all consider this quote to be more of a criticism of the founding generation or more of Ray, uh, Wilson giving them positive praise? I would say he's critical. And the thing that makes this, guys, I think an interesting quote is that you only have maybe a handful of people that, that, that probably at this point in time, maybe a little bit more than that, but that, that you get my point here, that are probably very open with saying, you know, our founding fathers had shortcomings, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we know that the slavery issue is obviously a big thing, et cetera. Okay. But what is he getting at here, guys? Think about what he's getting at. Okay. Law of adjustment to me basically means that there's wiggle room to basically adjust policy, government initiatives, et cetera, to meet the needs of that particular generation. Okay. So basically, guys, what Wilson is getting at here, this is a very, very progressive quote. 
Because essentially, guys, in my mind, what he's getting at is that, you know what? We need to understand that changing times, modern times, basically mean that we as a government need to adjust to those times to be able to meet the needs of the people. This is definitely his way of saying, guys, that the public interest adjusts, at least I would say, with the idea of modern times and ergo government must adjust with it. Now, whether you agree or disagree with him on that, guys, that's not what I'm trying to convince you of. But what we can take from this, guys, is that government is going to be more involved in doing a lot of things. Okay. Ergo, Wilson is going to put forth a new freedom. Now, you are more than welcome to pause this screen. This is our last major note slide, if you will. Okay. But I think it's important, guys, for you to really understand. Now, again, major reforms. Okay. There's four areas of reform in this case. Now, we're not talking about anything related to World War I. That's going to be foreign policy down the line a few weeks from now. Okay. But if you take a look here, you've got labor and business, banking, which applies to every person, guys, for good reason. We're thinking of money there, probably. The regulation of trusts and also conservation and the environment. Okay, so let's go over these in, in, in order, okay? And we'll hopscotch back to the banks here in a few minutes, okay? So the Department of Labor. So what is the Department of Labor? It is a cabinet position that still exists. You can Google it if you want to, but the idea, guys, of the, of the uh, Department of Labor is that they basically regulate things like, you know, working, labor, et cetera, right? There's a secretary that's going to serve in that position moving forward right? Meaning that every president is going to have a different one or a series of different ones, depending on how long their terms and if the person stays in office for a certain reason. Okay. And so that's a big deal. Now, what's the big thing when it comes to the idea of business and revenue? This is where the Underwood Tariff Act is going to be passed. Okay. The guys, the word tariff is nothing new. It's basically what? A tax on imported goods. Remember what I said a moment ago, the goal of progressive era reform in regard to the tariff is to lower the tariff. But there's a problem here, guys. And the problem is, is that when you're expanding government, you're creating an FDA, you're creating all these different um, government agencies, in other words, bureaucracy. The argument is, guys, is that government is going to grow in size. Ergo, spending more money on government is going to happen. Okay. Um, I know all of us have heard of the national debt. That's not as, you know, um, you know, popular, you know, then as it, as it might be in the modern day. But at the end of the day, guys, we know that government must in fact have money to be able to operate. Okay. Well, the problem here is, okay, if you're going to reduce tariffs, you have less revenue. How do you make up for that loss of revenue or money? Well, the answer is partly anyway the 16th Amendment to our Constitution, which is going to make it constitutional to have an income tax. Okay. Ergo, the first of the four amendments of this particular time period. Okay. Now, it's going to basically say, okay, by the courts, you know, decision-making guys, that the... Um, that the taxes, the income tax, excuse me, is constitutional, ergo it can happen. Okay, now the kind of tax that's gonna be put forth by the federal government is gonna be what we call progressive or what's also called a graduated income tax. Okay, every so often, you'll hear more about this guys if you take government and civics most likely, but as you move up in income level, there's gonna be an, in, an increase in the higher percentage of taxes that you have to pay. Okay. So let's say somebody that's in a, maybe a middle class bracket ends up paying 20, 25%. Okay. Um, and there's like eight within that bracket, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. If you move into one that's an upper class, let's say you're making millions a year, maybe billions. If you're somebody like Elon Musk or someone like that, then every time or most times that you move up an in income and there's certain amounts that you have to, to move up brackets, 
then basically what does that mean? Somebody like Elon Musk might be paying 30, 35, 40%. Now, there's arguments on both sides here, right? You know, some people would say, well, you know, he can afford that, right? This guy made, I think he's made since January of 2020, this particular year, I think he's made almost a hundred billion dollars off of Tesla. That's a lot more than I'll ever make. And I'm okay with that. I love my job. But at the end of the day, guys, the point is, is that income tax is going to become really one of the largest sources of revenue at the federal level. Before then, historical sources tell us it was the tariff. Okay. So it's going to be a sizable transition in revenue. Okay. We also have what's called the Federal Trade Commission. All right. Again, that's another government agency that is designed to regulate things like trade, uh, to make sure that it's just and fair. Okay. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to skip over banking for just a moment so that we can transition to our next slide a little bit easier. Trusts. Now guys, what did we just say about trust? The Supreme Court has been cracking down on the trusts. They've been using, you know, their judgment of the Constitution. They've been using their evaluation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Wilson administration, with Congress's support, keep in mind this is an act of Congress, believes that there needs to have more stringent legislation to be able to actually give the Sherman Antitrust Act more bark to its bite or whatever way you want to put it. Ergo, they're going to advocate passing what's called the Clayton Antitrust Act of, I want to say it was 1913. Okay. The most important thing, guys, with this act, for the most part, is that it's going to give more strength, more power, more enforcement to the Sherman Antitrust Act that goes back to 1890. Okay. All right. And then the National Park Service. Okay. This is an official agency that was created to actually give some more support to, re to regulating and also monitoring and managing parks. Okay. Guys, if you've ever gone to a national park before, um, you know, now it's pretty easy to kind of look up all the details given that we're in the online you know, or an internet uh, age or whatever. But guys, I mean, you can go to the nps.gov website. Um, the link is there if you want to write it down and do that. Um, and it's going to give you a lot of cool information about the, the different parks, what kind of things you can, you can do there. Um, now with COVID things, it's going to give you updates on how conditions have changed with how you can tour the parks, et cetera. Do they have the same kinds of ranger tours that they did you know, before COVID, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's a very cool website. And again, you know, it's a very important thing. Now, last but not least for sure, banking. Ladies and gentlemen, if you care about money, which all of you do, you should care about banking reform under Woodrow Wilson. Okay, because in 1913, I believe it was, the Congress is going to pass what's called the Federal Reserve Act. So what does that act do? It creates what's called the Federal Reserve System. Okay. The Federal Reserve System is going to actually be the, it's made up of a board and also a chairman. Okay. So it's a group of people. They make a lot of decisions on monetary policy and money supply. Essentially, guys, what they do is they decide how much money is going to be in circulation, which is essentially what monetary policy is. It's the money supply. Okay. Every time you hear them talk about we're lowering interest rates, we're raising interest rates, we're doing this, that involves money, etc. Okay. That basically means that they're making a decision about the amount of money in circulation. Okay. And so they're going to decide how much coinage of money do we do? Literally, a lot of you guys, if you've been, you know, if you live where I live in North Carolina, it's not that uncommon to go to a store and a lot of stores, restaurants, et cetera, now have signs up to say, you know, please pay in cash or use charge. Why? Because there supposedly is a national coinage shortage through the Fed. Okay. Anyway, that does not apply to my knowledge to paper money yet, but it does apply to coins. Okay. So essentially, guys, what this Federal Reserve System does is it monitors and regulates the monetary policy within the United States. 
If they want more money to be in circulation, that's what we call a, um, a loose money policy. If there's less money in circulation, we call that a tight money policy. Okay. You can debate whether you agree or disagree with either side, but at the end of the day, this group is very influential. I read an article several years ago, guys, that said, I think it was U.S. News and World Report that said that this um, publication, again, uh, it's, it's uh, an opinion, but I think some of the, the reasoning behind it is, is somewhat sound. Um, they said they considered the Federal, Reserve, the Federal Reserve chairperson, it could be male or female, we have had both genders serve that role before. But anyway, consider to be, get this guy's the world's 10th, most powerful economic force in the world economy, not just the American economy. That means that this group is pretty influential. Okay, so what does it do? Guys, really quick, it creates what's called fe uh, 12 Federal Reserve Districts. Okay, so if you take a look at this map, I'll show you a, a larger one here in a moment, guys. Each one of these different regions is going to have what we call a regional bank. Okay, so for example, those of you that are in California, your regional bank would be San Francisco. If you're in District 11, it would be Dallas. If you're where I live, which is North Carolina, it would actually be Richmond. If you're somewhere in this area, it would be Atlanta. Now, a lot of you guys might be asking the question, Mr. Baker, does that mean that you can only have currency? from one of those districts if you live within that district? And the answer is no. Okay, we're gonna do an activity in class, but also I'll try to simulate it online today that gives us an idea that you can actually tell which one of those districts bank, district banks, excuse me, your money actually comes from, okay? The question is, what denominations of currency in dollar amounts does the Fed produce? Ones, fives, tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds, et cetera. I have a little bit of an interesting question, and that is, do any of you know the highest denomination of, of, of dollar bill that was ever created by the Fed, but it has never been circulated to the mainstream public? Translation of that, guys, you could be as wealthy as somebody like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or you know whoever it might be, and you're, you're a billionaire easily but you could never actually have physical um, occupancy of one of those pieces of, of dollar bills. Okay. Do you know who, do you know what it is? Believe it or not, it's the $100,000 bill. Do any of y'all know who is on the $100,000 bill? <laughs> no, that's actually Photoshopped. It is actually Woodrow Wilson. Okay, for good reason. You know, he was an officer in the Federal Reserve acting past. All right. Now, the question is, guys, and we'll end with this, just a kind of a fun little part of our, our presentation to get you all thinking, guys, a little bit of, about the currency. How can we tell where our money is from, which one of these 12 banks? Okay, so guys, take uh, pay attention to numbers here. All right. Now, I ask my students to bring with them to class $1 bills, but you can do this with fives, tens, and twenties. But if you take a look at a $1 bill, you'll notice guys on $1 bills, you've got a little circle here beside, of course, the good old George Washington picture. And you can actually see the city. So this one says Atlanta, Georgia. But let's pretend, as we'll see on the next slide, guys, that you don't know where your currency is from. It doesn't tell you exactly the city do you all see the number here? That number is six. If you go back to this, you'll know number number six is Atlanta. Okay, so you can actually tell where your currency is from. Okay, so all these different numbers, like and letters, etc., actually have meaning to them. You'll notice Federal Reserve notes one dollar. The back also, of course, as a lot of you know, has um, has information on there as well. Okay. And the question a lot of students have is, okay, well, Mr. Baker, what if I don't have a $1 bill? How can I tell where that money is from? Good that y'all asked that. Actually, you'll notice here, it does not have the city in the circle. But if you take a look here, you'll notice that you do have the F6. The number six there goes back to the bank it came from. 
which is actually, as you can see here, Atlanta. Okay. Now, I've done this activity, guys, where I have students actually bring in currency, preferably $1 bills, and we go through and we kind of see how many um, different banks that we have represented, and it's kind of a fun activity. Um, what I've noticed in the past, and I don't know if any of you, if you're watching this from another state, maybe you want to see if this is true to your state or not. What I've noticed is that bills, dollar bills, particularly the $1 bills from Minneapolis and Philadelphia, and even St. Louis at times, and also Kansas City. So those four banks, again, I live in North Carolina, so maybe that's just given the state that I live in. Okay. But those four um, federal district banks, Fed district banks, are usually the harder of the four for me to come by. Okay. San Francisco at times, but most of the time you can find them. Of course, Richmond and Atlanta are pretty easy given the proximity where I live to those two banks. Okay. Um, and of course, Cleveland, et cetera, can be a little bit hard to find. Okay. So I end you with that. Okay. So progressivism is a fun time, guys. I think, you know, it's one of those things where government is kind of trying to remedy or solve these problems, whether they're financial with creating the bank system like we think of it now, et cetera. Okay. And I want you guys to think as we transition next time to our final lesson on progressivism, which is what are the limits to progressivism, right? I'll leave you at that question to ponder. This is the last, uh, this is the next to last of our, uh, of our progressivism. Hope guys, you had a great lesson. I know I did think progressivism um, and, and try to really kind of think of it, the big picture of it, but also understand the role of the presidencies with today. And as always, hope you stay safe. Have a great one. Feel free to email me any questions or thoughts at bakerd at franklinacademy.org. And as always, I hope that your day is going great. Have a good one, and I will see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.